Chip Kelly says UCLA starting quarterback is Ben Bolch. Wait, what? And also, UCLA is not in the top 25 for ESPN, men's basketball-wise? What is going on? Let's talk about it on Locked On UCLA. You are Locked On UCLA, your daily podcast on the UCLA Bruins. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome, everybody, to the Locked On UCLA podcast. I'm your host, Zach Anderson, Yoxheimer. Thanks for making this show your first listen each and every day. It's free where we get your podcast, and it's available on YouTube. So like, comment, and subscribe. Become an everydayer because, hey, you got some UCLA fun basketball, football content coming your way. And, hey, hit that subscribe button, review, rate. Thanks for all your support. Where we start today, is it where the UCLA basketball team is in ESPN's top 25? Absolutely. Because where are they? They're non-existent. ESPN released their not their way too early top 25, which is not the post-March Madness version. It's the, uh, the season's about two months out, and the teams have a general look basically at what all their rosters are, barring some extreme last-minute changes, that UCLA is the most mysterious team in the country, arguably. In my mind, I say so. ESPN starts off their article talking about how UCLA, all this love, McCronin, Final Four, Sweet 16, defending Pac-12 regular season champs, a lot of love, but they're having a revolving door from last year to this year in terms of what they're replacing, which is obvious. But then you have all this talent coming in for UCLA, one in the portal, a lot of it coming from their class of 23, and that just makes the Bruins a unique team to try and decipher and figure out, hey, is this team actually going to be good? Well, the pundits from the you know ESPN, they said, hey, we don't think that they're a top 25 team. They slot just outside the top 25 in their preseason poll while adding that it's tough to rate all the international products, which is true because for a while, Burke, Adai, some of these players – didn't have ratings. I know a die is a five star now, and Burke is basically a four star. And there's different ways to rate all these guys. Jan Vide has been rated from a three to a four. There's the on threes, ESPN's top hundreds, and the twenty four seven sports. So many different rival, so many different ratings. Right? The ES, you know, all these different places you could go. And you've seen even the early season bracketology released by Joe Lenardi. The Bruins are a little bit low down there, or pretty far down. When it comes to, hey, we don't think they're going to get a good seed in the tournament. And why I've tried to temper expectations, right? This is a team that I think can be very fun, will be very fun. And Spain didn't give us a good indication of what this team will be with no Mara, with no Bona, with no Burke playing. V-Day didn't even play that game. They lost in Spain. So they were without four scholarship guys and not truly practicing in between games because they're out sightseeing where Mick Cronin does his specialty, harping on players in practice, making sure they play defense. And without your three or two starting big men and your first guy off the bench in the post, that's not a real testament as to how good this team can be, even if it's in an exhibition, closed scrimmage-like format when you're playing European pros overseas. So this just makes for a unique year where UCLA has some tough road games, whether it's a neutral site game, you know, wherever they play some of these teams, they go play at Villanova, they host Maryland. Pac-12 play will be extremely entertaining when they get to play USC, when they play Arizona, and all the sneaky good Pac-12 teams that will be in bas- in the basketball conference this year, even though they won't get much mis- respect, just like the Bruins aren't getting here, right? You're missing Tiger Campbell, a longtime starting point guard. You're missing an NBA first-rounder with Jaime Hawkins Jr. Your best shooter and David Singleton, your sixth man. Amari Bailey, who easily could have been a first-rounder if he was healthy the whole year. You're then missing the likes of Jalen Clark, who was the best defender in the country. You're, you're adding on to the list of players who are gone, and then you've got UCLA, who's replaced it, and I've talked about it, other outlets have talked about it, how they could easily have three NBA first-rounders on this team right now in one-and-done-like formats, right? A Daimara, Burke, Bona. Bona easily could have been drafted if he was healthy enough to leave 
by the time the draft happened, if he didn't go diving into the, the first row during the Pac-12 tournament. So it's tough for me to sit here and wonder, how does UCLA, of course there's obviously the, the brand bias, which is maybe what I'm going to play off here. How does UCLA not get that love preseason top 25? You can be so tough going top to bottom, one through 25, that, all right, UCLA, where are they? We don't know, but we're not even going to throw them a bone as the top 25 team in the country. Yes, I'll give them the bone that in this way too early top 25 list, the Bruins are in the top 30. That's not even the worst. That, that's easily making the tournament. But what's unique about this for UCLA is you've got so many opposite sides of the coin. You've got, this is the best recruiting class UCLA has ever had, which is a big statement, especially in the Cronin era, in the modern era, right? Obviously, UCLA has some all-time great basketball players, college basketball players, NBA greats come through their program. And now we have a team that we just don't know because the international recruiting pool is so new to the game, right? You've got Kentucky getting their own seven-foot unicorns. You've seen Gonzaga tap into it. The mid-majors, even St. Mary's, right, which is kind of that borderline in the WCC, they've been hitting international recruits for quite some time. And now UCLA and all the other schools are slowly catching up and understanding, hey, this is where we're going to go to in the future when we're grabbing guys. And yes, it's going to be tough to analyze in Milan Fible, Avide, along with Burke, who was one of the latest additions. We don't know how quickly a Daimara can adapt to this game. So it's going to be a unique battle for this team as they understand and say, hey, where are we going to go top to bottom in – Late game scenarios. Who is going to play defense? Who's going to be the starting five? Who will be the closing five? Who's the first one on the bench? All around everything in between that makes it a unique battle top to bottom for this squad that you just you just don't know. You just don't know what's going to happen, which you know makes way too early top 25s the biggest joke of them all, right? Isn't that the biggest joke? But I was just stunned that UCLA doesn't even get the respect, the credibility of being one of the blue bloods and yes, you want to rank it as fairly as possible. But if you've got all these stars, which in the end of things don't really matter, but you can't say on one hand that they're going to have three NBA first rounders and that they're not one of the top 25 teams in the country. And yes, they're replacing a lot. UCLA is only returning about 13 points per game between the Andrews, the McClendon, the Nubas, all of that together. They're not returning that much production from last year's team that made it to the Sweet 16. This is a completely new team. And yet, they've got a lot of talented pieces. I'm not going to sit here and tell you the Bruins are guaranteed to be in the Final Four and Elite Eight. They're going to win the national championship. They definitely have the talent to do so. But they should not also be sitting outside the top 25 in most of these polls. Could they this season easily become one of the more disastrous campaigns and this be a flop? Certainly. I just don't believe that to be so. I think Cronin is absolutely one of the game's active best coaches, right? You can go to different articles, different debates as to, hey, who is one of the better coaches in college basketball? Well, you, you have Mick Cronin on that short list as coaches coaching right now who are really good. So he's going to get his team ready. Even the team that made it to the Final Four wasn't playing that well. They weren't hot. They weren't playing well at the end of the season. They got the job done. You could call it the bubble tournament, whatever you want to do. He got that team, and the Bruins played well to the Final Four. Then they got to the Sweet 16 and Sweet 16 after that and were easily playing some of their better basketball at the end of the 1920 season when the season got cut off. So to tell me that I don't think, despite all the cultural differences, language barriers, all the newcomers trying to understand the system for Mick Cronin and what it means to be a UCLA basketball player, even if the players have never even been to the campus until the most recent days, just landing like at a Daimara and a Berkey Bullington chill have, I still would give the Bruins the benefit of the doubt. A top 25 team, at least in the preseason, I think they're easily one of the top 25 best teams in the country. Now, will they win a, a tournament game? Could they get upset? All those things, very possible. But you can't sit here and tell me that, yes, while mysterious, unknown, they will struggle. They probably might lose more games than we expect and want to admit as UCLA fans, but I just don't believe we could sit here and understand top 25. Give me a bone. At least put them at 25. Come on. It's, 
It's unique. And I could easily be wrong. And I'm willing to admit there is some mystery. There's a lot of mystery to this team. I just don't think it is right to throw it in the face of Cronin. And with the, all the talent that they have brought in, that they're going to fail so miserably. It, it could be interesting this year. It certainly will be. And I'm not going to sit here and guarantee a championship. But they're a good team. And they'll play very tough this year. We'll just see how it all ends up. Coming up, we're going to talk about Chip Kelly's joke with the L.A. Times beat writer for UCLA football and basketball and Ben Bolch, who probably might have his own words to say about UCLA not being the top 25 for hoops for ESPN's way too early top 25 list a couple of months before the season. But was he their starting quarterback? No. But what does this mean heading into the San Diego State game going into week two? We'll talk about that, what Chip Kelly had to say when we come back on Locked On UCLA. Welcome back. You know, let's talk about some awesome things you're probably missing out on. If you're sitting there looking for a championship team, you're looking for all the right pieces, the right parts, right? The, the right fit to the puzzle. And if you're trying to make sure that every player is a perfect fit, it's the same when it comes to your vehicle. Every part needs to fit just right. So when you need parts and accessories, head to eBay Motors eBay guaranteed fit we can make sure that every part fits just right the first time around. So go to my garage, look for the green check to know that your part will fit or your money back. Because in sports, the name of the game is confidence, which is what you can do when you shop on eBay Motors. And it's easy to bring home a win when the right parts are guaranteed. So get the right parts, the right fit, and the right prices on ebaymotors.com. Let's ride. eBay guaranteed fit, only available to U.S. customers. Eligible items apply. Only and exclusions apply. Segment two of the Locked On UCLA podcast. Zach Anderson, Yox, I'm with you guys. So what is this quarterback saga that we sit here wondering, right? I know the Bruins are going to have this saga probably throughout the whole season. We might go quite a few. We might probably get this into October before we truly know who the starting quarterback is. And it still might flip-flop a couple of times after that, unless an injury happens. We hope that's not the case when all these players being healthy and playing out their full season, however it plays out. And we still just don't know where they're leaning. Chip Kelly came out and jokingly, very jokingly, as Ben Bolch has noted and maybe other media outlets have noted as well, there's a lighthearted sense to Chip Kelly this year. Despite all the questions at quarterback, a two-headed monster at running back, different pieces he needs to cycle in in receiver, a defense that's looking to revamp, revitalize itself in the now fifth, sixth year of Chip Kelly's tenure where it's never truly been that good when Chip Kelly's been the head coach of UCLA. And he's just got this ease about him. You're moving to the Big Ten. You've got the extension. Wouldn't you feel like the weight is on your shoulders when you lose all your veterans? No, Chip Kelly's been lighthearted. So that's why he's joking. Hey, uh, Ben Bolch is going to be our starting quarterback. Yes, the LA Times beat writer. And we're going to hand it off, a lot of handoffs, exclusively in the run game. Jokes aside, it's coming down to what Dante Moore showed. You've got Colin Schley and Ethan Garbers. The two quarterbacks vying truly for this job are Garbers and Moore. What Schley is battling, at least in my mind right now, is a certain package or two or three and where he can play some situational football that I think only really works if you combine it with Dante Moore. Not that it can't work with the Garbers, but I think the difference between a Schley and a Moore are just so unique between a youngster that could do anything, throw the ball on a dime, and Schley, who can be a good dual threat, a more of a, not necessarily a running style quarterback, because that's what San Diego State's Jalen Maiden is, but he's someone who can run the football and certainly change it up. I alluded to this in week one where Schley, did punt a few times before at Kent State, so he's someone who could line up in the four, on fourth down and do this once or twice, at, once or twice in the season where he'll pooch punt it and pin the team deep. Even though Will Powers was just absolutely blasting the ball in Week One versus Coastal Carolina, Kelly did once again guarantee, which he did guarantee before the first game, and he's guaranteed once again in Week Two, although albeit with some snide remarks about the clock and the game time and everything in between at halftime against the Chanticleers that 
Schley will play, Dante will play, and Garbers will play against San Diego State. And we'll get to their defense at the end of this podcast. We'll talk about that and why that could be a unique battle for these three quarterbacks that are now expected to play, which were we were expecting in week one. But this is such a unique time because they still don't know the answer to who's going to be the starting quarterback. And Chip Kelly's not going to give out any answers as to who is the, the one that might get more reps, who's going to start, at least not from what I've read at the dropping of this podcast and recording of this podcast. I haven't seen anything that says this guy's going to start. Chip Kelly won't come out and say it necessarily like he did week one for Ethan Garbers, which makes me think they might be leaning to Dante more. You know, what I want, what we think, what we've seen, all can be very different things. And I'll, as I said, I'll talk about why San Diego State's defense is unique coming up. Do you go with the veteran and just make sure, hey, we're not going to have a silly mistake that might put us down 7 nothing? Uh, although you, I know, everybody listening, watching, probably has different opinions. Garbers, oh, he didn't look, he looked stiff, robotic. I, I'm not going to go fully into that. But the offense definitely hummed a bit better when Dante was in there and could add a unique wrinkle with Schley coming in, not as the backup, but as the situational guy to do a third and one, a third and two, a fourth and one or a fourth and two, and get a trick play in for a touchdown, pooch putt, everything in between. I do think Garbers has a role on this team, a significant role, and will make a significant contribution this year in a quarterback way that is not in a relief way. When and how that happens, I can't tell the future. I just think Garbers will have his moment to shine. Will it be Jerry Neuheisel-esque? Not quite against Texas, but... I do think Garbers will have his moment to shine. That could easily happen against San Diego State. Say Dante Moore struggles early. I do have this inkling he might start. There's no, I have no basis to base it off of other than what I saw in person against the Chanticleers in the Rose Bowl. It it should be a packed out stadium in Snapdragon where San Diego State's already two and zero. You win that game, you're three and zero. You might be on the verge of being ranked if you're the Aztecs, even though they haven't looked all too impressive to me, at least with the eye test, and or at least you know just kind of looking and seeing and reading. They just haven't truly scared me in this game, but the, this is a unique one where the Bruins could lose it heading on the road in a packed environment in where they've never lost at San Diego State. They lost four years ago in 19. Chip Kelly wants to avenge that, but Brady Hoke's a good coach against an Aztec team that can play some good defense, which just makes this three-quarterback system even more hair-raising and just kind of bonkers going on the road. How is it going to work? Three separate guys wanting to learn the plays, a much quicker tempo in terms of game, time, possession, play limitation, where it should be a loud environment, and I just don't know where it's going to go. The Bruins haven't announced it. I think Dante will start. He should start. And I want to see where it goes from there, especially after what I saw week one. He should start. And if it goes awry, then we can play this game in week three. But that's against NC Central, and that will be a different type of heat before the Bruins go and play Utah on their Pac-12 opener on the road in Salt Lake City. So it is nice that UCLA gets a road game before Pac-12 play, unlike they did to start the 2022 season, and it'll be a unique battle. How it goes, we'll talk about why the defense is so unique for San Diego State and why they've done so under Hoke and why they've been dominant over the last near decade for a San Diego State team that's been one of the top two teams in the Mountain West for quite some time. We'll tell that all and more coming up next on Locked On UCLA. Final segment of the Locked On UCLA podcast, Zach Anderson, Oxheimer with you guys. The Bruins... You're bringing in three quarterbacks, so it will be a rowdy road stadium. I'm expecting a sellout, if not anything close to it. I think Snapdragon holds about 34,000, if I'm not mistaken, out in Mission Valley. So it should be well over 30,000. The Aztecs have not had that this year in Week 0 or Week 1. I don't think Ohio would draw that crowd in August, and playing Idaho State is certainly not going to draw a sellout. UCLA should absolutely bring that. If you look look at ticket prices to go to try and get to this game – a little pricier than it will be to go to the Rose Bowl this year with much less seating, a beautiful stadium from what I believe Chip Kelly said. And I think I'd love to go, but in the end, it it will be a crazy one to see how it all plays out. 
The defense should be amped for this San Diego State team. They play a 3-3-5 stack. They force six turnovers in their first two games, three interceptions in each game. They face two quarterbacks in week one, two quarterbacks in week two. So when it comes to San Diego State facing multiple quarterbacks, they will not be faced. Both teams in Ohio and Idaho State had both quarterbacks throw 10 or more passes. So it wasn't like one guy came in and threw a Hail Mary pick like what San Diego State did, I believe, last week or a week ago. They did that fairly recently when someone came in, threw a bomb, and got intercepted just for one play. San Diego State is accustomed to facing multiple quarterbacks. They've already faced two or more. So the fact that UCLA is going to throw in three or tease that they're going to use three quarterbacks like Chip Kelly is doing right now, that's not going to phase this 3-3-5 defense. When they allow less than 24 points under current coach Brady Hoke, they're 35-3. and three. The last 50 games the Aztecs have played, they've allowed under 18 points per game in their last 50 games. This season alone, or excuse me, yes, this season alone, they have not allowed a single rushing attempt that has been 20 yards or more. Not that the Bruins truly gash Coastal Carolina, but UCLA still was able to run the football. Carson Steele, TJ Harden, they were able to move it pretty similarly down the field on the same amount of pitch count, right? The same amount of carries. They ended up with the same amount of yards, about five or more yards per carry. San Diego State has not allowed teams to be successful throwing the ball without forcing picks, and nobody's been able to run the football against them. Now, it's only been 47 carries, I believe, against them, just about 50 or so, something that's been a low carry amount, right? In the first two games, the opponents have been throwing the ball a lot against the Aztecs. Ohio threw it 51 times for only 26 completions and under 300 yards passing, one touchdown, three interceptions. Uh, Ohio carried it for 31 times, only 111 yards, but only a 14-yard carry was the longest run in that game in Week 0. Idaho State ran the ball 15 times, only had 34 yards rushing. Mind you, San Diego State against Idaho State only had 85 yards passing, and they still were able to win that game by rushing for over 300 yards. So the difference between the Aztecs and the Bengals in week, in week one for San Diego State, their second game, nearly 270 yards plus difference in rushing yards. Now, it's tough to get 270 rushing yards in a game, but to have a difference between the two teams is that remarkable. Idaho State somehow threw it 63 times, even more than Ohio did in Week 0, 300 yards, a couple of touchdowns, and three INCs. So this has been a ball hawk defense that returns six starters, a unique defensive style, and will prey on any Bruins mistake. Because remember, they already threw three picks in Week 1. Garbers got hit on one of them. Moore was almost given a free shot, but floated it up where that's if you're a quarterback like Moore, you tuck it and fall to the ground and stay in field goal range, which would have made it a two-possession game at the time. Young mistakes. So this is a team that has been able to say, hey, we're not going to get, we're not going to lose because they don't give up points. The offense has been somewhat of a struggle for San Diego State in recent years, but overall, they've been able to get 20 or more points. They win more than... 80% of their games, right? And when they've scored 20 or more points in their first couple of games this year, they're 2-0. So dominant football when they've been able to control the clock, score just three times, basically, three touchdowns worth, and their defense has been a stalwart these last few seasons. So how does that continue to happen for San Diego State? They force turnovers. They've been one of the best teams the last seven, eight seasons at forcing turnovers. And despite three turnovers against Idaho State, They've been one of the best teams at throwing the fewest interceptions over the last few years. And I know you can't pull stats from 2015 necessarily and bring that and correlate that to 2023, but generally they've been focusing, especially when you're trying to be a better Mountain West team and compete with the teams in the Power Five or across the country or even within their own conference to make a, a Group of Five appearance in a New Year's Six Bowl, at least for now until we expand the playoff. They've been priding themselves on taking care of the football and very good defense. They beat UCLA 23-14 not too long ago against a very young DTR, and they have an opportunity from a rocking home crowd, what we expect to be a rocking home crowd, a team that's run the football very well over 200 yards per game, a defense that is, I believe, a plus two or dominant, at least 
Tur forcing turnovers, seven tackles for loss, five sacks, six starters returning, the 3-3-5. And I wonder what Dante Moore is going to look like if he starts against this defense in a rowdy environment, if he can get a playoff. Or Garbers facing a different system, wanting to regain that confidence, get in a flow if he's not given the opportunity to play throughout the whole game. I believe Garbers did make mention of was he fully comfortable knowing that someone was coming in after him over and over with a lot less plays happening due to the time change of the clock rules, no time stopping after first downs. And then you've got another quarterback to fix in the mix with Schley, who is supposed to be the least accurate of the three quarterbacks, hasn't gotten any playing time, so he's still got those jitters to put on that UCLA uniform and come into a game. And who knows what it's going to look like when it comes to a dual threat read option type play or where he's got multiple options, read it, look for a pass, run, hand it off. You wonder what that's going to look like for Schley. So Chip Kelly's got a lot on his hands to juggle three quarterbacks, technically two transfers, considering Garber's already a transfer years ago, wanting to keep them all happy, even though he doesn't want to admit it, and make sure what's the best way for this football team to win in week two and keep us all engaged heading into week three and eventually week four against Utah, who might be or we expect to be, hopefully, if they can beat Baylor despite rising out, an unbeaten matchup to open up Pac-12 play in Salt Lake City. Now, to get there, there's a whole lot of twists and turns that will happen between now and then, focused centrally on what happens in the quarterback, how the offense, which didn't look too impressive overall against a pretty unique San Diego State defense, and this will be the most physical test in the first three games for the UCLA defense against the team that has just been running and pounding the rock over and over again, even though Maiden's proven in the end of last season, 2022, he can throw the football. Right now, it's up to the Bruins to handle the, the defense for the Aztecs. Can it happen? Absolutely. But that's where if they had a veteran quarterback or just somebody who had played the majority of the game and dominated against Coastal Carolina, you would get a lot more confidence heading into Week 2. I do think UCLA will win this game. It won't be without its struggles. It won't be without its low moments. I do think the Bruins can come in here and find a way to win in San Diego and do so like they did so many times against the Aztecs in years previous and try to get their first win in over a decade plus against San Diego State or close to it. So watch out for the defense. They will force turnovers. They haven't allowed a run over 20 yards, so it's up to Steele or Harden to be the first time, first team player this year to do that against an Aztec defense. And what's going to happen, I'm not entirely sure. But that will be a fun battle. Three quarterbacks versus a defense that's already seen four quarterbacks in the first two weeks and doesn't allow anybody to run down their throat. I don't really know anything, but that will be a fun battle to watch in what is one team's third game, biggest game of the year, and versus UCLA's kind of silent trap heading into week two where we don't really know what to expect from an offense that didn't truly – dominate like we expected it to as chip kelly offenses almost always do that's going to wrap it up for locked on ucla in the comments you can put your frustrations is ucla basketball top 25 worthy you can continue to throw in your opinions about hey hey even put it on social media who should start for ucla at quarterback and what do we think about san diego state's defense i know they played idaho state i know they played ohio those aren't world beaters i know chip kelly gave a lot of love to ohio's quarterback but still, you've got to respect the fact that the Aztecs will be coached up and ready to play defensively against multiple quarterbacks that do not have a lot of experience, for the most part, playing full games, and they won't get that against the Aztecs in a crazy, rowdy road environment. I'm Zach anderson Yoxheimer signing off, saying thanks for tuning in. Like this video, comment, subscribe, download the audio version, and thanks for making this one of your first listens each and every day. As we build throughout the week, stay tuned for more basketball content and and and, and more build-up football-wise on the Locked On UCLA podcast. Let's get your hands up, Bruins fans. Eight clap time, baby. And one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. U C L A. U C L A. Fight, fight, fight. This has been Locked On UCLA. Go Bruins.